Hello, everyone. My name is Andrew Pucker, and today we're here uh, with another clinical podcast from the AAOF. Our special guest today is Kim DeWong. She is a assistant professor at the University of Houston College of Optometry. Kim, could you please give us a little background about yourself and how you practice? Yeah, of course. So um, as Andrew said, my name is Kim Dong. I am currently at the University of Houston. Um, and in, at U of H, I'm currently in the pediatric and contact lens um, department. Awesome. And I've loved myopia for years. I ran the myopia control clinic at UAB, which is where I met Kim. And also I'm the clinical and medical sciences director at Lexitas Pharma Services. So let's get into it. So Kim, uh, we have this paper that's titled Repeated uh, Low-Level Red Light Therapy for the Control of Myopia in Children, a Meta-Analysis of Randomized Controlled Trials. Could you give us a little bit of overview of this paper and maybe why it's important to the field? Yeah, I mean, I think most people have heard about myopia in the recent years. It's such a big buzzword nowadays. Um, the World Health Organization projects that half the world will be myopic by 2050. So that means clinically, we're going to see more and more myopes in our practice, needing either glasses, contacts, or even some form of myopia control. And you know, furthermore, as a result of myopia, we're going to see more ocular pathology associated with this myopia. Um, things such as retinal detachments, you know, cataracts, maculopathy. And so this myopia myopia epidemic has been such a major public health uh, concern even before you know the COVID-19 epidemic and now due to the COVID-19 epidemic um, there's increase in screen time decreased time outdoors which may further increase this um, incidence of myopia um, luckily though thanks to research in myopia um, clinically we're able to provide uh, many different methods to help slow down this myopia progression in our patients. Um, in the United States specifically, um, current treatments include orthokeratology, low-dose atropine, um, and multifocal contact lens. And so the efficacy of these ranges anywhere from you know, 30 to 60%, depending on the study that you look at. Um, and then although these are great options that we have to offer our patients, um, given the large number of projective myopes, myopia research is a hot topic. And so um, research are always looking for more feasible, more effective ways to slow down this progression. And so today's paper touches on the usage of repeated low level red light therapy to slow down the progression of myopia. And I'll kind of refer to it ju as just red light therapy because it's a mouthful. <laughs> that is a lot of words. <laughs> yeah. I totally agree. So we have contact lenses in the United States. We have atropine, but not every patient can use those, right? Like maybe you're not quite ready for contact lenses or maybe atropine is just too expensive in your area. And, and buying one light box could be an economical way to treat the population. So could you tell us a little bit about how that might work in your house or your practice, that treatment? Yeah, um, you know, exactly what you said. It may not work for everyone, you know, the atropine and the contact lens. And, you know, these are little kids that we're dealing with. So not all kids like putting contacts in their eyes or eye drops. And so, um, you know, this device um, can be very helpful. It's kind of an alternative, um, you know, method that we um, can provide for these patients. And so um, in this paper, um, specifically, they use this red light therapy um, that um, emits around either 635 or 650 nanometer in wavelength. Um, and this device is actually approved by the Chinese FDA, um, but not in the United States. And so um, how they've been using it um, in China is that the subjects are treated um, for two, three minute sessions kind of per day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that doesn't sound too hard. So in this study, and that sounds super useful, hopefully we can have it soon in the United States, yeah. assuming it works, which is what we're going to learn about in this, this paper, right? So 
Could you tell us a little bit about the Cochrane review process, which they use? This wasn't a Cochrane review per se, but they followed their methodology. So could you just give a little background on how they did this study and kind of the level of evidence that arises from it? Yeah. So um, many researchers can consider Cochrane-like reviews um, to be the highest level of research. Um, you know, these Cochrane-like reviews are original research and they are consists of these uh, randomized control trials um, with human subjects. And so um, the review process generally starts with a database search um, and then you are followed by some data collection and quality assessment. Um, and this process is usually done by, you know, two authors independently. And, you know, if there's any um, discrepancies, they usually, um, you know, discuss it and sort it out. Yeah, these these are great studies. I've been involved with several. And the fastest one I did was two years. <laughs> like, it's a <laughs> lot of work. <laughs> and you're lucky if you can get more than a couple of people to help with it. But um, what, what were the kind of... Main, main takeaway points we learned from this specific paper? Yeah, so um, according to the paper, um, they um, did a whole database search and ended up including seven randomized control trials. Um, and their conclusion was that the red light therapy is effective in slowing down the progression of myopia. So um, this meta-analysis showed that red light therapy significantly reduce axial length and increase the cycloplegic spherical equivalent refractive error. Um, and then the study um, included um, studies that were either six months or 12 months in treatment um, duration. And so the treatment appears to be additive over um, the one year time frame. So, that, so that's super exciting. We have one year's worth of data. I'm sure that more would be needed, but how do you think that this treatment actually works? Why does red lights potentially slow the eye growth? Yeah, um, you know, myopia is just so complex. And so the underlying mechanism um, still really remains unclear. Um, there's a couple of proposal um, suggesting that maybe there's an increase in sustained choroidal thickness. Um, or even some, you know, scleral remodeling as a result of this red light therapy. I think that's really an important point there. So we know that the choroid responds to this light. And if you get a thicker choroid, you also get a thinner, sorry, shorter axial length. But that is not proportional. So it's only like a small part of the, the shortening or you know, slowing of eye growth is coming from this choroid. So it's probably other stuff going on. And like you said, Kim, it's super complex. And I think it's going to take decades to really unravel that. But it's super fascinating to me. Something else is playing a role to be determined. <laughs> determined. More podcasts to come. So yeah. <laughs> with that, do you have any kind of closing thoughts or take home points that you want our listeners to know about? Yeah, um, you know, one of the take home points is that, you know, myopia is a global epidemic, it's not going away anytime soon. And so, again, we're going to end up seeing more patients with myopia and, you know, complications arising from myopia. And so um, an important point is that clinicians should really consider myopia control, you know, in their care. Um, you know, this research is super exciting, um, but the interaction between light and myopia is complicated. And although this study shows that red light has great potential for slowing down the progression of myopia, I think clinicians still need to be precautious um, on this device as, you know, it's not readily available in the United States and um, we don't quite have a good grasp on the long-term safety and efficiency of these treatments. And so, um, you know, stay tuned for more groundbreaking research. <laughs> I, I totally agree. I think I looked in all the papers included in this study were published in the last year or two. So very, very recent stuff, not fully vetted yet, though I agree we need to do something and hopefully other cool things like this keeps coming along. So with that, I'd like to thank you for being here, Kim, and I'd like to thank the listeners for tuning in. Please come back for many, many more podcasts to come.
Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>